Hello and welcome to this course on artificial intelligence for Earth monitoring. I'm Dallas Campbell and I'm going to take you through this course as you discover how cutting edge artificial intelligence and machine Earth observation science and the benefits that this has for citizens. The course will provide you with an overview of the different types of AI and ML and the fundamental techniques of working with AI algorithms for analysing satellite-based Earth observations and in-situ data. You'll also be able to work with hands-on tutorials using Jupyter Notebooks so you can see for yourself how AI works. We're going to cover four thematic areas, so oceans, atmosphere, land and climate. And in each of these topics, you'll be learning from experts who use AI to discover more about Earth and to solve some of the fundamental problems that we face as a society. This is a Copernicus course developed by UMETSAT in partnership with ECMWF, Mercator Ocean International and the European Environment Agency. We look forward to seeing you on the course. Hello and welcome to UMETSAT and welcome to the end of this massive open online course on AI machine learning and looking at the Earth's environment using satellites and other data. Of course, this course is a partnership between ourselves, UMETSAT, um, the European Environment Agency, Mercator and we're all part of the Copernicus Initiative, which is an initiative to bring Earth observing and other data to people that can become useful for citizens in Europe and around the world. Behind me, you might see the UMETSAT flags. We're coming to you from UMETSAT in uh, Darmstadt, so just south of Frankfurt in Germany today. And it's great to see you coming from all around the world. There are people from 163 um, countries in this course. It's truly been a global course and you're really, really welcome to be here. If you have friends who would still like to join the course, they can. So um, people can still sign up. You'll be able to have all the resources available for eight weeks um, so and very simple to do. Um, I'm Mark Higgins. We've met before, but I'm joined today by Dr. Federico Feely. Hi there, Federico. Hi, Mark. Um, Federico is our atmospheric compositions kind of applications expert. So, Federico, what are some of the things you work on uh, at your time in UMETSAT? We, we work to engage with, uh, with users, uh, with uh, persons that are willing to uh, build application, make science, uh, uh, using our data and especially in the field of atmospheric science, pollution uh, and also with the some twist of climate. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and so I know you're working on a ton of stuff at the moment, so you've got a, a course on dust that's on at the moment. What's that about? Uh, yes, sure. We, we, try to, uh, we try to engage with the different audience and also we try to uh, provide the data sets and applications that are useful also for things that can be an emergency like dust. Just imagine uh, the impact that you can have, for instance, on uh, aviation. Mm. Uh, we also work uh, just now on uh, wildfire detection. And uh, we will have at the end of, uh, of the month of, uh, of December, just before Christmas, uh, uh, an engaging uh, Copernicus school to, uh, together with our partners. In that case, European Center for uh, Medium Weather Range Forecast, that is also partnered to this MOOC, and uh, the European Space Agency. So please uh, join as well and, uh, and uh, make use of these uh, great resources. And the other thing you're working on at the moment is this um, ocean atmosphere uh, workshop. So the yeah, well, do you want to talk about that? Just yes, briefly. sure. Uh, we also wanted to explore uh, really the, the edge of the science. Mm -hmm. uh, so the relation between the ocean and the atmosphere are really crucial because, I mean, for instance, uh, they are key for the budget of carbon dioxide in our planet. And then we want to talk, to talk with the scientists that the worldwide work with the, uh, with the satellite data sets to, to understand which is the status of the science and which are their needs, uh, not only now, but the next decades in order to build up and uh, to, uh, to make uh, instruments that are really responding to the big mm. societal and scientific questions that are put up about the, all that is a great community we talk to. Fantastic, thank you. And we'll come back to Federico later on when we look at some of the atmospheric composition questions that you've asked during the course of this week. Let's turn to some of your questions. So the first question is from Christina. She has a question related to searching green color in the sea. So can, can you detect red tides and can you even predict them? And Rod Rodrigo was asking a, a similar question. Would it be possible to predict red tides, so neurotoxins, um, 
and look at the historical data to maybe do some predictive type work and then use the satellite data to verify that. Um, the, uh, Rodrigo's in uh, South America and he has a problem with that. So yes, we can. So the, the red tides um, are related to some of the biogeochemistry of the ocean and the nearshore environments. And on some of the sensors that we have in space, there's particular frequencies that are very, very uh, sensitive to this kind of thing. So the, the 0.51 and the 0.55 um, micron kind of areas. And so what you can do there is really detect the biological signal of these events. However, not all red tide events or, or, or events where there's um, algal blooms are harmful algal blooms. So you do need some local knowledge and some local observation of the water environment to really help to characterize that event. And the prediction is really tricky. So the occurrence of these events, um, it's related to a whole bunch of factors. So it includes the availability of light, of nutrients, what the wind dynamics is like, what the human interaction with the environment is like, any coastal runoff, and so, um, and the actual composition of that plankton community at the time. So the predictions of that complex environment are quite challenging. You can, of course, use a, a climatological approach. So by knowing your area, and by sort of seeing the classical signals that um, come, you can then make some degree of forecasting. And I do wonder if there is a, an approach that can be made using statistical modeling. But it's a very tricky environment to be needing to use the satellite and in situ observations to monitor these events so you can issue the warnings as they start to occur. There's a, a question um, from Etienne, which is, building on a concept we talked about last time, which was the use of citizen science data. So we talked a little bit about what if people had their own sensors, um, either in a building or on the side of a building or out in a field, or maybe it's mobile, how these can be used within the, the more sort of formal observing mechanisms. And, and we, you know, we mentioned that these data are really useful, and Etienne's asking, can they actually be used within the global numerical modeling um, uh, for weather forecasting, so the global what we call NWP numerical weather prediction system. And there are a number of weather services around Europe who do this, so the, the Spanish weather service do it, the UK weather service do it, the Norwegian weather service do it, and there will be others. And what they're doing is taking the data that comes from people's own and some of those observations, they've actually gone out and verified the location, they've checked the quality of the sensor, or people have had to buy a particular kind of sensor so it fits into the, the framework that's working. And those data are actually feeding in. And there's quite a degree of quality control that comes in, not just for citizen science observations, but for all observations. Because um, they're drawing from observations all around the globe from multiple resources, um, sources all the time. So it's quite important to be able to just check, has something changed in the quality of this observation? Do we need to put it aside for a while and then bring it back in later when whatever the problem is has been fixed? And that is all detected automatically. So that's all part of the NWP systems. Now these systems, they, the, the models are becoming really quite finely scaled. So you can get some models down to three kilometers or less. And so this is where those high fine observations can really make a difference when you're looking at cities or, or places that have less observations. But this is also quite a, an exciting and growing area. And this is also, I wanted to come back to you, Federico. So in a minute, we've got a couple of atmospheric composition co uh, mm -hmm. questions. But you and I have talked about some mm -hmm. of the interesting citizen sciences approach that might be available now and in the future for atmospheric composition type stuff. Yes, I mean, sure. The, the citizen science uh, is, a, is a twofold. It has, uh, on one side, the aspect uh, to engage the citizens uh, on, uh, on important problem. And just think about pollution. I mean, this is really felt as, a, as an emergency because uh, it, uh, it deals with what we breathe every day. But on the other side, also to, uh, to provide observation that, uh, as Mark has explained, can be useful, <coughs> for instance, for operational applications. And, uh, and for pollution is, uh, is also very important because, in general, the, uh, let's say the official instruments uh, to measure their quality are quite expensive and are not really 
uh, are not really uh, totally distributed and air pollution can be really changing from uh, one point to another. Huh? Uh, let's say, for instance, at the third floor of a building or in the middle of the road. So, in principle, having the possibility to monitor with uh, low-cost instruments or portable instruments the, the, this type of changes and this type of uh, variability of the pollution is, uh, is extremely important. So, there is really research that is going on uh, in uh, uh, certifying this observation and uh, identifying which is the information that can, for instance, uh, taken for the operational forecast or also for the assessment for the air quality. So, is uh, is really opening. And mm. one last uh, uh, last part is about the engagement in uh, in satellite evaluation, in satellite validation. So there are uh, uh, specific configuration that you can use. For instance, your with your mobile phone like this. Uh, and measure uh, and measure similar quantities to the satellite. So, in principle, building up uh, a network for the satellite evaluation that for us is uh, absolutely vital. Mm. So, do you want to turn now to some of the the questions that people have been asking? Yes, sure, well. sure, sure. There is uh, there is one question that is uh, uh, quite related to that and comes from Ankit. And uh, the question is about how their pollution forecast down to the street level can be achieved globally using uh, AI, because, I mean, satellite resolution we know that are limited. And uh, this is a very, very good and important question, because uh, is, uh, is really at, uh, at the edge of the knowledge and the, and the research. Uh, in fact, uh, the artificial uh, uh, intelligence make use of a mechanism that is in jargon is called downscaling. So how, for instance, uh, from an information that is large scale, I can uh, derive an information that happens and, and at a much smaller scale. So in order to do so, uh, in fact, we, uh, we, we make use of, uh, we make use of, of satellite data. Uh, let's imagine uh, that uh, there is a satellite uh, that is observing Mark and myself. Uh, there is no difference from the satellite point of view. Uh, but I mean, for instance, uh, you replace Mark with someone else, much taller, <coughs> uh, much bigger, and uh, then uh, the signal of the satellite changes. Mm. So in some way, uh, even if they observe just the two of us, uh, it is possible to make an inference, for instance, if Mark has changed right now. And, uh, uh, and uh, this is done also, for instance, for air quality. So the satellite observe what happens, for instance, at, at the scale of, of, of a town. But if there are changes, uh, for instance, in the, in the composition, if there are peaks of pollution, these uh, can be some way detected. And then artificial intelligence uh, uh, has, a, has a big role there. Because uh, you, you have, uh, uh, you build up uh, on the existing observation and uh, you, uh, you make, uh, you train uh, your, uh, your system in order to attribute uh, what may cause this change, also taking into account, for instance, a different type of weather conditions. So this is, uh, this is an extremely yeah. uh, important uh, and uh, extremely, uh, and extremely uh, interesting, uh, interesting application. Uh, we also have a second, uh, uh, a second question that uh, still comes from, uh, uh, from Ankit. And uh, uh, the point is, uh, why does some good research areas, topics, suggestion for, uh, for a computer engineer in air quality in the domain of uh, machine learning for, uh, uh, for Earth observation? And uh, I mean, I, I can only just uh, encourage uh, Ankit and I mean all the, uh, all the persons that are interested in this field, because I consider personally that is, uh, is really growing. Uh, because uh, there is uh, an enormous need uh, to, uh, to, to apply different concepts and uh, to have, uh, for instance, people that has uh, a very strong background in IT, in uh, data science, in, that is in this specific mm. part. Because just to think, for <coughs> instance, we need more and more accurate models, we need more and more accurate tools uh, to deal with the data. Uh, just to think about what will happen with the new satellites uh, in Copernicus, with the Sentinel. We will have mm. an explosion of the dimension of the data, and then there will be a great need to extract information and to deal with these uh, enormous and uh, uh, potentially really is a really big game changer for the next uh, generation. So it's really, it's really an endeavoring context, and uh, uh, yeah, let's uh, keep, keep tuned on that. Uh, we have uh, an additional question from Roman Andres. Uh, is about uh, uh, is about uh, the possibility to uh, measure clouds. So there will be there is or there will be any Copernicus European mission with similar capabilities uh, than the uh, the NASA one, uh, like the CloudSat, Aqua, and Calypso to measure the clouds. And uh, the answer is uh, yes. 
uh, but uh, there is no uh, there is no mission or there is no uh, constellation like the one uh, uh, from Aqua, Calypso and CloudSat mm. that was absolutely endeavoring, uh, great from our colleague in the NASA, uh, in the NASA uh, dedicated just to the clouds. But the sentinels are, uh, are also thematic, so there are sentinels measuring the atmosphere, sentinels for the land, for the ocean, but each of these subtle important also for the composition. I think, I, actually, d just to sit on that for a second, because one of the most exciting things about the that I think will change between, say, five years ago and five years' time is people using multiple instruments to address the same problem with the combination of the data that comes from the UMATSAT programs, the UMATSAT polar system, and METASAT third generation, and all the Sentinel data. Exactly. It's, it's just an explosion. It's amazing. Exactly. And uh, if we can just mention, uh, you know, the, the, the story of the, uh, of the elephant, uh, the tale of the elephant, uh, with uh, the different person touching different parts of the elephant <coughs> uh, and, uh, and trying uh, to, to understand which animal is. Yeah. Uh, now we have the possibility to have different people that, uh, that do this. So you touch different parts of the same, uh, of the same object or the same animal and in fact uh, artificial intelligence has also the role mm. to create links uh, and to build <coughs> uh, to help us uh, to build a global yeah. picture uh, I have a last question about uh, about air quality and uh, is a question on uh, on the satellites uh, POMI uh, is an instrument uh, that uh, uh, that provide a map and this question comes uh, from Pedro uh, provide a lot of map uh, uh, of uh, trace gases like nitrogen dioxide, ozone and so on. And uh, the question is about uh, the carbon dioxide. I mean, carbon dioxide is, uh, is really also with the, the, the COP that, is, uh, that was just uh, uh, ended uh, really a, 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 key, a key parameter and uh, is, uh, is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a great paradigm, no? is a very important paradigm. So they, they ask if, the, if this will be me is measured by tropomy. Uh, the answer is no. Uh, because as we know, uh, the, uh, the carbon dioxide is responsible for the greenhouse effect, so for trapping the uh, Earth radiation. And the Earth radiation is uh, at a different wavelength, so it's in a different uh, uh, spectral range than the one that is used to measure the other pollutants. So you need a specific instruments to do so. And that these instruments need to be very resoluted. So you, you, you need a specific missions. But don't worry, because on one side, uh, there were uh, are the speaker real if yes are they producing energy that would be interesting in addition to being used for demonstration purposes only the answer to that question is no so I think that was from the um, EPS satellite from the METOP satellite um, which has a solar panel on it that solar panel is about twice the size of a, a household solar panel if you've seen those it's actually generating a, a similar amount of power um, obviously, it's in the space environment, but on the models, no, they are, they're literally models, but that would be an interesting idea um, for the future. So we'll mention that to the people who procure the models to see if that might be a possibility for something in the future, because I think that would be kind of fun. And it does show the level of power that the satellite actually requires. So if you imagine just two of those panels is all that we need to power all of the instruments, the active instruments and the passive instruments are the ones that are sending signals down, as well as to transmit the information back down to Earth as the satellite is moving, as well as when it Alec made a comment monitoring the land. <coughs> are there surface areas of the Earth where the quality of the data is reduced to the shape of the Earth? For example, near the poles. So the quality of the data won't change due to the um, shape of the Earth, but the coverage does effectively. So over the polar areas for the polar orbiting satellites, they always go over the poles. So that's where we get a lot more coverage over the poles, say 14, 15, 16 times a day. And the swath of some of the instruments, sometimes there's a gap between the swaths on the equator. So the, there'll be a pass and then a small gap and then a pass. And you can see that, for example, if you only look at one of the Sentinel-3 satellites, you'll see that over the tropics, there are gaps in the passes. It's one of the reasons why we have the two, so that you actually have that swath gap. The, the orbits are designed exactly so that there's no swath gap over the tropics. So you see that for, for some polar orbiting uh, satellites. From the geostationary satellites, we can always see wherever the geostationary satellite is looking, so the whole of that disk, and there's always a lot of international col uh, collaboration to make sure that we cover the whole globe. But of course, the geostationary satellites have a struggle to see the poles which is why the interplay between the geostationary satellites and the polar satellites is so important. So it's not a, it's not a change in uh, 
data quality, but it is a change in coverage. You get more coverage over the poles from the low Earth orbit satellites. And when we design the satellite missions, this is one of the, the questions that goes in. Because if there's something that must be monitored every day, which in the case of the Sentinel-3 data, the ocean and land, the full ocean and land every day, then we need to have the full coverage. Masaisi asks the question, each of the Copernicus Sentinel missions carries state-of-the-art technology to deliver a stream of imagery and data tailored towards the needs of users. What's the spatial coverage of each and can I get, say, two days back? So yes, um, to the, the spatial coverage varies from uh, instrument to instrument. But the, you're probably most interested in the, in the optical sensor data, so the, the physical, visible image data. Sentinel-2, the resolution is 10 meters, or the pixel size is sort of 10 meters. And um, Sentinel-3, the resolution is 300 meters. And you can get the record from the Wekio uh, platform. So if you're in Wekio, you can actually get the data from a, f um, a few days to a few months back. So th and that record's important. And that's one of the wonderful things about having the satellite data, not only that ability to see how things change. It's something that really matters. It's how we can spot changes in patterns and pattern. That is also uh, extremely, uh, extremely important because of the, uh, the climate change and the impact on the radiation in our planet is not only brought by, uh, by, the, by the CO2. And last but not least, uh, water vapor is also very mm. potent, uh, uh, a potent greenhouse gas. Probably is, uh, I mean, is the one that uh, influences more the uh, the climate on the Earth. And of course, it is uh, it is uh, it is possible, likely that there are changes in in the water vapor uh, mass and the water vapor concentration in the atmosphere due to climate change. And the Sentinel data, the Sentinel instruments, uh, and also including the UMETSAT missions, uh, they uh, they monitor the monitor water vapor. And there are of mm. course group. Uh, of scientists and the satellite experts uh, that uh, make uh, this observation available and its observation harmonized for climate studies. And it's a really important, Federica mentioned it earlier, it's a really important part of monitoring the Paris process and monitoring the contributions we make towards anthropogenic climate change by being able to support this with the satellite mm -hmm. data. That's the end of your questions. Thank you all so much for the questions you've asked. It's been really quite a joy to see how many questions that have been in the forums, on social media, and also this continual engagement you've got with each other where people are answering each other's questions. And, and I, I come back again, it's a, it's a really impart, important part of the science community and how this works. The fact that I can ask a question and someone else can answer from around the world um, who, who has a, a resource or can answer the question directly mm -hmm. is, is super important. So if you know stuff, do carry on sharing it. And I'm really grateful for what you've been doing. I've got a couple of other things I'd like to mention just before we finish. One of them is there's a competition coming up. Now, during this course, we hope you've made a huge use of the Jupyter Notebooks and that they've been useful to you in getting started with your journey on AI, machine learning, and these data. In January, what we'll be doing uh, from UMETSAT is launching a bit of a competition to get people to generate Jupyter Notebooks to support visualization and machine learning. Um, there will be prizes, um, so do watch out for that. We'll be announcing it um, on Twitter and other places. But the main idea is to carry on generating stuff that makes these data easy to use. And we're very aware that the skill is way beyond us. There's plenty of other people who um, can, uh, who have got notebooks, who can generate notebooks that are, are really good and help people mm -hmm. get involved with this data. So there'll be prizes, and I'm really looking forward to seeing what you can do. Um, it also occurs to me that many of you have been doing super creative things. And I was talking earlier with uh, Neil from the production gang, and we've got a bit of a spontaneous competition. Hopefully this will work. We haven't really thought it through, but... If you have uh, created something new or slightly different during the course of this course, get it posted on Twitter, tag us, pipeline, competitions, and hopefully future, uh, future courses. The whole Copernicus enterprise, we mention it a lot, um, we get enthusiastic about it, but it really becomes meaningful when the data that we produce and the partners produce gets used to do useful stuff for people around the world, to create good in the world. That's not the bit that we do. We just provide the thing that helps it to happen. 
um, it's you who do the good stuff. And so I wish you luck with it, but also that's an important part. Just, just know it's all there. And if you, if you get stuck, if you need help, get in touch with the various service help desks because they really are there to, to help you out. And they, they really um, do enjoy helping people to actually make genuine use of the data. It's a, and it's a fun part of the whole thing. I'll add one reflection just on the finish. So in this course, we've talked a lot about AI and machine learning. That's been the main bulk of the course. And it's been about how to use all of this environmental data in AI and machine learning to understand the atmosphere and the environment that we live in. But one of the major issues is, of course, this is where we live as people. And there's quite some research and thinking that is now going into what's the relationship between science and decision making and real people's lives. So do watch out for opportunities that you've got to take advantage of social science data or social science learning. Um, one particular example might be um, there's a, a thing called co-creation where you can design systems and procedures and processes with the people you're trying to help. And they tend to take into account the diversity of the communities that we really are. They take into account the people who might be slightly marginalized. If you've got people in hospital who are slightly older, who have got mobility issues, um, how do their needs get reflected in whatever you're designing? And I think that is one cutting edge, cutting edge area of AI machine learning that is we're going to see grow hugely over the next five years. So we're going to see more data coming in. We're going to see faster algorithms. We're going to see more cloud processing environments. All the technical infrastructure, and a lot of that's going to come through a thing called Destination Earth. But the what does it mean for society bit, there's some real space there for human orientated innovation that I'm getting really excited about and I'm really looking forward to. So we'll stop there, but thank you all for joining. Thank you again, Federico. It's a joy to have you here. Thank you very uh, much. Thank you to the people who are the other side of the cameras. That's Jonas, Neil, and Natalie, because um, this really wouldn't happen without you. But most of all, thank you to everyone who's taken part in this course. It's been a joy to watch you grow and learn through this. Thank you all very much. Hello and welcome to this course on Artificial Intelligence for Earth Monitoring. I'm Dallas Campbell and I'm going to take you through this course as you discover how cutting-edge artificial intelligence and machine learning technologies are helping to advance Earth observation science and the benefits that this has for citizens. The course will provide you with an overview of the different types of AI and ML and the fundamental techniques of working with AI algorithms for analysing satellite-based Earth observations and in-situ data. You'll also be able to work with hands-on tutorials using Jupyter Notebooks so you can see for yourself how AI works. We're going to cover four thematic areas, so oceans, atmosphere, land and climate. And in each of these topics, you'll be learning from experts who use AI to discover more about Earth and to solve some of the fundamental problems that we face as a society. This is a Copernicus course developed by UMETSAT in partnership with ECMWF, Mercator Ocean International and the European Environment Agency. We look forward to seeing you on the course.